Welcome to our final Engineers Newsletter live broadcast of 2003. I'm Mick Schwedler, an Applications Engineer with TRAIN, and I'll be your host for today's subject of High Performance Schools. While preparing for today's broadcast, we had to think about what performance is being measured. To be sure, the desired output from any educational institution is educated students. To deliver high performance educations, high performance facilities are helpful. Now let's look at what's been happening with respect to these facilities. In the federal sector, the U.S. Department of Energy has an Energy Smart Schools program that helps educators and building designers interact to produce high performance schools. And in 2001, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the High Performance School Act. While it did not become law, it gives us insight on how people at high levels are viewing schools. In its purpose, it discussed the energy costs of schools in the U.S., and yes, that's $6 billion a year, as well as the fact that proper ventilation, lighting, acoustics, and comfort helps the students and teachers perform. It would have allocated $200 million annually as grants for new and existing schools to become high performance schools. So there's certainly interest at high levels. On a state level, we found more high performance school programs than we realized were out there, including the Collaborative for High Performance Schools, referred to as CHIPS. Now it was developed specifically for California's varied climates. A word of caution here, because of different climatic conditions, it's important to study the details of various programs before adopting those practices in your locale. Now in your handouts are two slides that show attributes of Congress's act and the CHIPS program. But when we looked at all the programs, we found some common attributes used to describe high performance schools. First, the whole building design and use must be considered and integrated. As we'll see later in the broadcast, integrating the building envelope and other issues brings some new challenges that need to be resolved by the entire design team, including not only the design engineer, but also architects, electrical engineers, educators, and the school districts. Now, not surprisingly, health of occupants is very high on the list. And in all the programs, efficiency in the terms of energy and site and water usage and then cost effectiveness are also linked. Proper comfort, including humidity control and acoustics, are identified as necessary for good indoor environmental quality. And so is proper lighting. And daylighting or natural lighting of spaces is also addressed. When aggregated, these attributes lead to designs that are referred to as sustainable. They work with the environment, including site, energy and water usage and are easy to maintain and operate. Now in a 90 minute broadcast, we can't hope to address all of these in any depth. So we'll overview a number of the major issues, then focus on a few. In addition to selecting high efficiency pieces of equipment, from an energy standpoint, we've had engineers newsletter live broadcasts on all of these issues with the exception of water usage. So there are many resources available to you to help with the designing of high efficiency, low life cycle cost systems. Now certainly another efficiency high point is lighting. From a lighting standpoint, power levels have decreased while illumination levels have increased and included the use of natural lighting. While investigating various programs and specific jobs for this broadcast, many include daylighting and daylighting controls. In fact, a Pacific Gas and Electric study performed by the Heshang Mahone Group found that learning rates were 26% higher in reading and 20% higher in math in rooms with the most natural light. Now, daylighting does not just mean more windows. For example, in our graphic here, a light shelf is used to get the natural daylight into the room without causing the heat or glare of direct sunlight. And there are a number of very good daylighting references available. They're listed in the bibliography for the broadcast. Uh, certainly with today's focus on the environment, a building that's sustainable is stressed in high performance schools literature. 
While the details vary between programs, site and materials use, as well as the use of resources such as energy and water are all considered within the bounds of life cycle costs. All of these elements must also be integrated to ensure that an enhancement in one decision does not degrade the overall design, operation, and sustainability. During this broadcast, we'll see how the topics already mentioned integrate with three issues that deal with comfort, health, and the learning environment. After discussing ventilation, moisture control, and classroom acoustics, we'll spend some time looking at high-performance schools from the school's point of view. And while the specifics may change depending if it's a K through 12 school, a university or a trade school, all require the same fundamentals to be done well in order to become high performance schools. Gary Lipke, a principal marketing en engineer with Crane, will help us understand not only ventilation requirements, but also some challenges that are dependent on the ventilation location and other design decisions. Then applications engineer John Murphy will discuss building moisture control in general and then specific methods for improving dehumidification performance of HVAC systems that are commonly used in school. This summer we published an engineer's newsletter on classroom acoustics. Its author Dave Guckelberger is here today to look at how various systems comply with acoustics requirements. Finally, Pete Berger will give us some information on how school funding issues differ from other projects and help us understand how educators and local school officials view these same issues. Following these discussions will be our question and answer session. The fax number for questions will appear periodically on your screen. Please send them in as the broadcast moves forward. Now, Gary, we know that ASHRAE Standard 62, which is ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality, is a portion of comfort in schools. Can you please help us understand how ventilation and other requirements fit into high performance schools? Sure. Many sources today confirm that the quality of the air inside of a building is critical to the health and performance of the occupants. Children in classrooms are particularly vulnerable to indoor pollution because their breathing and metabolic rates are high relative to their size, much higher than that of adults. Achieving and maintaining a high level of indoor air quality is therefore critical to schools. Delivering good IAQ requires a holistic approach to how a building is designed, how it's built, and certainly how it's maintained and operated. The basic elements of IAQ can be broken down as contaminant source control, proper ventilation, moisture management, and proper filtration. This section of the broadcast will deal with three pieces of the puzzle, source control, ventilation, and filtration. Specifically, we will be looking at deciding where the outdoor intake should be located, determining the amount of outdoor air required to ventilate various areas in schools, and assessing the quality of that outdoor air and what steps need to be taken if it does not meet the minimum requirements. It's no accident that controlling contaminant sources appears first on our IEQ puzzle. Controlling the sources of contamination should be fundamental to any IEQ management strategy. Minimizing or removing the source of pollutants is almost always easier and less expensive than diluting, capturing, or removing them once they are inside the building. Pollutants take many forms and can originate inside or outside of school buildings. Let's look at some indoor generated contaminants that are commonly encountered. Chemicals, specifically volatile organic compounds or VOCs, are found inside all buildings. One VOC, formaldehyde, used in the manufacture and construction materials and indoor furnishings, slowly outgasses from laminates and furniture after installation. Benzene is a solvent found in adhesives and cleaning products. Improperly applied, and stored cleaning products and pesticides are also common sources of pollutants and irritants in schools. People also contribute contaminants to classrooms. People emit body odors, skin flakes and moisture, as well as viruses and bacteria. Because schools are more densely populated than most other types of buildings, the people-generated con contaminants must be carefully addressed in classrooms. Activities or processes that take place within the school can also introduce unwanted chemicals. Shop areas, kitchens, and art rooms contribute unique pollutants, some in the form of odors, others are particulate matter, and even noxious vapors. Exhausting strong sources locally, proper ventilation, 
and negatively pressurizing those spaces relative to the surrounding spaces can help contain these contaminants and keep them from spreading to other areas of the building. Location of the outdoor intakes is important. Schools using terminal systems such as unit ventilators or wall hung units draw in ventilation air locally at each unit, typically near each classroom. This results in a high number of locations and thus many opportunities for entrainment of pollutants. Buses idling outside the school for extended periods of time, lawn care products or pesticides, and, or even microorganisms that may live in the landscaping immediately outside the classroom can all pose a problem. Solutions such as remote bus loading, allowing pesticide application in lawn care only during unoccupied periods when the outdoor air intakes are closed or even paving small areas immediately beneath the outdoor air intakes can greatly reduce the potential for bringing these contaminants inside. With central systems, outdoor air is typically brought into the building at a fewer number of locations around the building, typically high on a sidewall or through the roof. The fewer number of entry points and their elevated location makes them less susceptible to ground level pollutants. However, even roof-mounted intakes must be carefully located to avoid, in, avoid entrainment of exhaust air from bathrooms, locker rooms, or kitchens that may be in the vicinity of the intake. While most of these potential sources are certainly manageable, they need to be considered, some during the design phase, while others will be dependent on how the school is operated and maintained. It's important to note that proper operating procedures need to be fully documented by the designer and then carefully communicated to the school staff so they can operate the building as the designer had intended. I suspect most designers just consider it good practice or common sense to locate outdoor air intakes away from strong contaminant sources. Historically, neither Standard 62 nor other guidelines specifically address the separation issue. Be advised that Addenda 62AA, currently in the review process of Standard 62, will specify the minimum distances that sources such as dumpsters, cooling towers, and loading docks must be away from outdoor intakes. Although not yet final, some of the proposed distances are 15 feet for dumpsters and 25 feet for cooling towers and loading docks. This will probably not be a big deal for most projects, but it is something you should be aware of. In light of the recent terrorist events, school designers should also consider the susceptibility of air intakes to biological, chemical, and radiological attack. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, and ASHRAE have published very good information providing guidance on reducing a building's susceptibility to attack. While many believe this is much more of a security issue than a technology issue, there are some things that designers can do to make buildings inherently less vulnerable to attack. Bottom line, outdoor air intake should not be easily accessible, and mechanical equipment rooms need to be off limits to unauthorized personnel. Unfortunately, the days of having equipment room doors propped open or an unrestricted ladder to the roof are over. I suggest that you review the sound advice that NIOSH and ASHRAE have compiled on this topic. Links to these documents will be listed in the bibliography. Now let's move on to ventilation. How much outdoor air is needed in various school spaces? ASHRAE Standard 62, through the continuous maintenance process, is changing the requirements for ventilation system design for classrooms. Historically, most designers have used the ventilation rate procedure to determine the amount of outdoor air required in spaces. This prescriptive procedure has been changed significantly by Addenda 62N, which was approved for publication by the ASHRAE Board of Directors in early summer 2003. It is expected to be published on the ASHRAE website by January 2004. Let's take a look at what's changed. Perhaps the biggest difference is that the procedure now separately accounts for the contaminants generated by the occupants and those generated by the building. Here's an excerpt from Table 6.1 of 62N dealing with educational facilities. This table replaces Table 2 in the previous standard. First notice that some new space types have been added. Some, such as classrooms, have been further broken down according to the age of the students that are expected to occupy them. We can see for both categories of classroom, the amount of outdoor air required for the people is 10 CFM. To that, however, must be added the 0.12 CFM for each square foot of classroom for the contaminants generated by the building and the contents. Note that the area factor 0.12 CFM per square foot for classrooms is double that required for lecture halls, while the value for daycare and art rooms goes up to 0.18 CFM per square foot. These values reflect the contaminant load expected to be generated in these building areas regardless of the people. Using the new procedure, let's quickly calculate the ventilation rate for a second grade classroom, 
measuring 32 by 32 feet that will be occupied by 26 people. The people-related ventilation rate for eight-year-olds determined using the 10 CFM per person from table 6.1, and the predicted number of people in the room, in this case 26, is 260 CFM. To determine the building and contents component, the area rate per square foot of 0.12 is multiplied by the area of the room. This requires an additional 123 CFM of outdoor air for the classroom to handle the building-generated contaminants. The total amount of outdoor air required for this classroom is 383 CFM. Now, in comparison, using the previous version of the ventilation rate procedure, we would have taken 15 CFM per person times the 26 people for a total of 390 CFM. As you can see, in this case, the ventilation rate is essentially the same for both procedures. But what about situations where the design occupancy may not be known? Addenda 62N lists default values based on typical occupant density. Using that approach, we see that the outdoor airflow rate for classrooms with five to eight-year-old students is 15 CFM, which is really unchanged from the previous standard. However, classrooms for older children, nine years old and up, went down to 13 CFM per person, while preschool areas increased to 17 CFM per person. It's also interesting to note that the previous version of the standard estimated classroom occupancy at 50 students per thousand square feet. That has been lowered to 25 for rooms with five to eight-year-olds and 35 to nine-year-olds and up. Metal and woodworking shops, referred to as industrial shops in previous standards, now have the default occupancy value of 20 people compared to the 30 people per thousand square feet in the earlier standard. This reduction in occupancy reflects the movement throughout the education industry towards smaller class sizes. Although the resulting amount of ventilation required for classrooms doesn't change much, there are significant changes in the way the designer arrives at the zone ventilation rates. From the perspective of design, heating, and cooling load, classrooms differ from other types of spaces with regard to the number of people that typically occupy a space. Just as we learned, ASHRAE Standard 62, Addenda 62N, assumes that typical occupant density is 25 to 35 students per thousand square feet. To put this into perspective, Standard 62 assumes five people per thousand square feet in offices and 15 for retail spaces. With the amount of outdoor air required in a space driven heavily by the number of people in the space, classrooms typically require 45 to 50 percent of their supply air to be outdoor air. This, plus the fact that people exhale significant amounts of moisture through the respiration process, can pose a dehumidification challenge for some traditional HVAC systems applied in classroom situations. John Murphy is going to address moisture issues in a little more detail a little later. Any way you look at it, ventilating classrooms significantly impacts a school's first cost as well as its ongoing operating costs. This has led to the development of a number of different control strategies to minimize the amount of outdoor air used. The goal of all of these strategies is to vary the amount of outdoor air brought into a space to match the number of people currently in the space. Some simply use an occupancy sensor or a predetermined schedule to turn off ventilation when no one is in the room. Others, such as CO2-based systems, attempt to count people or determine current CFM per person by sensing how much exhaled carbon dioxide is in the space. Ventilation reset on variable air volume systems monitors the airflow provided to each zone and resets the outdoor air quantity at the air handler to assure the zone requiring the highest concentration of outdoor air is always satisfied. Regardless of which strategy is employed, a means of modulating and in some cases measuring outdoor air will be required on the air handler or terminal unit. Engineers newsletters have been written that specifically address each of these control strategies and will be listed in the bibliography. Now let's take a moment to look at the ventilation air from the standpoint of how clean it needs to be. The use of outdoor air for ventilation is based on the premise that the outdoor air is cleaner than the indoor air. While that's usually true, there are cases where the air surrounding the building can be also a source of contamination and should be treated before it's used for ventilation air. If the outdoor air in the vicinity of a school is heavy with particulate matter, say from a nearby manufacturing operation, additional filtration may be required. Gaseous pollutants and odors can also be an issue that may need treatment. ASHRAE Standard 62 now includes web published addenda that better define and strengthen the outdoor air cleaning requirements. The designer is now directed by addenda 62R to consider the outdoor air quality for particulate and chemical contaminants at the regional level for compliance with NACS, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. 
local air quality must also be based on an actual site survey. When particulate matter in the outdoor air exceeds the NAx limits, particle filters with an efficiency rating of at least MERV-6 must be used to filter the outdoor air. MERV stands for the Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value and is the rating method established by ASHRAE 52.2 to specify filter efficiency based on particle size. For reference, a MERV-6 filter would have a dust spot efficiency of about 20%. Standard 62Z further requires that if outdoor air ozone levels exceed established limits, ozone removal devices with an efficiency of at least 40% must be used. This is important where schools are constructed in densely populated urban areas. In summary then, we need to be aware that schools have some unique pollutant sources that need to be managed. You need to be aware that Addenda 62N changes the way outdoor air quantity is calculated for most spaces. Minimum separation distances are now required for potential contaminant sources and intakes. And lastly, there are now stiffer requirements regarding the quality of outdoor air used for ventilation. Gary, thanks a lot for taking us through the source control, ventilation, and infiltration requirements for high-performance schools. And please, audience, make sure you fax in your questions for, for the question and answer session at the end of the broadcast. Now let's look at that fourth part of the puzzle. Uh, many times in our industry, we read literature or hear speakers talk about humidity control. Well, this is something that HVAC systems help with. We really need to step back and understand that moisture control is a much broader topic than an HVAC system's humidity control. Let's ask John Murphy to help us understand moisture control and options available to us. Uncontrolled moisture in a building can make occupants feel uncomfortable, reduce indoor air quality, and damage a building structure or furnishings. Now, scientists agree that excess water or dampness can contribute to mold growth inside buildings and minimizing the sources of this moisture is generally considered to be the best way to help minimize the risk of mold growth. Now moisture can enter a building as a liquid or as a vapor from several sources. Liquid sources include leaks in the building envelope, rain or snow that enters through outdoor air intakes or is tracked in on shoes and boots, groundwater seepage, leaky pipes or appliances, wet cleaning processes such as carpet shampooing, accidental spills, and condensation on cold surfaces. Roof leaks are a common source of unwanted moisture, especially in large, low-rise buildings like K-12 schools. Also, elementary schools have dedicated restrooms in many classrooms. This extra plumbing increases the risk of leaky pipes. And in those schools with carpeting, wet cleaning processes are a significant source of moisture that is often overlooked. Make every effort to thoroughly dry carpets within 24 hours. Finally, common areas where unplanned condensation can occur are door and window frames, on the underside of wall coverings, and on cold pipes, ducts, or equipment. Water vapor is generated inside the building or it can enter from outdoors. Indoor sources include respiration or perspiration from people, evaporation from open water surfaces such as pools, and combustion or cooking processes. Outdoor sources include humid outdoor air that is brought in by the ventilation system, humid air that infiltrates through cracks and other openings in the building envelope, which includes doors and windows, and diffusion through the envelope. Now, schools have outer doors that are open frequently during the day, especially elementary schools with recess periods or university buildings with frequent class changes. Also, kids coming in from recess often generate lots of moisture due to elevated rates of respiration and perspiration. Now it's important to recognize that moisture can enter a building around the clock. Significant amounts of moisture can be drawn into the building when it's unoccupied through infiltration if the building is under a negative pressure. Now this can be common in a school if it shuts down the ventilation system after students leave, yet allows the restroom, locker room, or kitchen exhaust fans to continue operating. Now minimizing the problems related to unwanted moisture requires us to ask, where in the building do these problems occur? Now first, some moisture related problems occur inside the walls or ceilings. Other problems may occur on the surfaces of walls, ceilings, or building furnishings. And some more occur inside the HVAC system. 
Now, as part of the bibliography, we've included a brief list of recommendations for minimizing the risk of moisture-related problems in each of these three locations in the building. When re you review this list, it becomes readily apparent that the HVAC system cannot prevent all moisture-related problems in a building. Preventing moisture-related problems is a shared responsibility among all parties involved in the design, construction, maintenance, and use of the building. In addition, many of these practices lie outside the expertise of the HVAC industry, which again emphasizes the need for an integrated approach to designing and constructing the building, as well as the need for effective education on its proper use and maintenance. Now, while the HVAC system cannot eliminate all sources of un unwanted moisture, when properly designed, installed, and operated, it can help minimize some of the sources. Now, specifically, it can prevent rain or snow from entering through the outdoor air intakes or from leaking through equipment or casing or roof curbs. Second, it can help manage the condensate created intentionally at the cooling coil. Third, it can help control the indoor to outdoor pressure difference. And finally, it can help limit indoor humidity levels. For today's broadcast, I'm going to focus on just one of these issues, limiting indoor humidity levels. Now, although many of today's HVAC systems can adequately control the indoor dry bulb temperature, several of them allow the indoor humidity levels to rise, especially during part load operation. Those of you who watched our broadcast in August of 2000 may remember the psychrometric analysis we used to demonstrate the part load demification performance of what we call the basic constant volume system. Now we're only going to review the highlights of that analysis today, so if you want more detail on how various systems dehumidify a part load, I encourage you to either watch the video of that broadcast or get a copy of our Demification in HVAC Systems application manual. Both are listed in your bibliography. Now this is a schematic of that basic single zone constant volume system. It supplies a constant quantity of air to a single classroom. A thermostat compares the dry bulb temperature in the space to a set point. It then modulates the capacity of the cooling coil until space temperature matches this set point. At the traditional peak dry bulb design condition, when the outdoor air is the warmest, this basic constant volume system can control space dry bulb temperature to the desired set point and maintain relative humidity at an acceptable level, 52% for our example classroom. So what about at part load conditions? Well, the outdoor dry bulb temperature is lower, so the sensible cooling load in the space drops because conduction heat gains are less. There may also be a decrease in the solar load depending on the time of day and orientation of the windows. So as the sensible cooling load in the space decreases, this basic constant volume system continues to supply a constant quantity of air to the classroom. In order to avoid overcooling the space, the supplier temperature must be warmer. Supplier temperature is increased by reducing the capacity of the cooling coil. In the case of a chill water coil, this is typically accomplished by modulating the control valve to reduce the rate of chill water flow through the coil. In a typical DX application, a compressor cycles on and off. Now, although this control action successfully maintains the desired temperature in the space, reducing cooling capacity in order to raise the supplier temperature makes the coil surface warmer. This results in less dehumidification and space humidity rises. At a part low condition, when the outdoor dry bulb temperature is not as warm, but outdoor humidity is higher, this basic constant volume system controls space temperature to set point, but space humidity rises. In our example, it rose to 67% compared to 52% at the full load condition. Again, reducing cooling capacity to raise supplier temperature at part load results in less dehumidification and elevated space humidity levels. You're right, John. Uh, the humidity levels are up. They're at 67%. What does that say about actually using constant volume systems? Well, in some applications and in some climates, these systems will dehumidify just fine. But in other applications, particularly in densely occupied classrooms, and, t and particularly in humid climates, they may not dehumidify adequately at part load. Now, one word that you kept using before was basic constant volume system. What's being done with constant volume systems to address the higher density of people and humidity levels and the more humid locations? Well, next section of the broadcast, we're going to look at three common types of HVAC systems that are used in schools and some methods for improving their dehumidification performance. The first two, chill wire terminal systems and single zone DX units typically are basic constant volume systems just like the example I shared. The third is a central VAV air handling system. Now a chill wire terminal system 
uses a central cooling plant to distribute chilled water to terminal units that are located in or near each classroom. Each terminal unit is a basic single zone constant volume system that contains a fan and a cooling coil. Examples of equipment in this category may include classroom unit ventilators, fan coils, or blower coils. Now we'll look at three methods commonly used to improve the part load deification performance of this type of system. The first is a multiple speed supply fan with a controller that automatically steps down fan speed at part load. The next is direct control of space humidity by overcooling and tempering or reheating the supply air. The third is a dedicated outdoor air system that dehumidifies all of the incoming ventilation air and then delivers it dry enough to also offset the space latent loads. Let's start with the multiple speed supply fan. Now many terminal units have fans that can run at different speeds. And depending on the equipment, fan speed is controlled either manually with a switch or automatically by the unit controller. As the cooling load begins to decrease from full load, the control valve reduces the rate of chill water flow through the coil to reduce cooling capacity. As the cooling load decreases further, the terminal unit controller automatically responds by switching the fan to low speed, and the control valve opens to compensate. As the load continues to decrease, the valve reduces water flow through the coil while the supply fan continues to operate at low speed. This reduced supply airflow results in a colder supply air temperature at part load. The coil removes more moisture and dehumidification performance is improved. In this example, space relative humidity improves from 67% to 60%. Stepping down fan speed as the first step to reduce cooling capacity improves the dehumidification performance of the terminal unit and also offers an acoustical benefit, particularly for a terminal unit that is located in or very near the classroom. The fan is quieter when it operates at a lower speed. Now in addition, the terminal unit controller must automatically adjust the position of that outdoor air damper for low speed operation to assure proper ventilation. Well, this all highlights the important role that unit controls play in providing a chill water terminal system that performs properly. The second dehumidification enhancement we'll discuss for a chill water terminal system is supplier tempering, or reheat. This configuration includes a source of heat downstream of the cooling coil and a humidity sensor located in the space. In the normal cooling mode, the capacity of the cooling coil is modulated to maintain space temperature at set point. However, if the humidity sensor indicates that space humidity is higher than a desired limit, the system switches to dehumidification mode. In this mode, the capacity of the cooling coil is increased, dehumidifying the air enough to maintain space humidity, and the downstream heating coil raises the supplier temperature just enough to avoid overcooling the space. Now this enhancement provides a means of directly controlling space humidity. In a chill water terminal system, the heat used for supplier tempering is typically provided by electric heat or hot water or steam coil. Now if the system contains a boiler, it needs to be available to operate during the cooling season to provide this type of humidity control. And the school's personnel responsible for the HVC system need to be made aware of this. As an alternative, using heat that is recovered from the chiller may allow the boiler to be shut down during the cooling season and can also reduce system operating costs by avoiding the use of new energy for reheat. Furthermore, heat recovery may allow the system to meet requirements of local codes and energy standards such as ASHRAE's 90.1. Now realize that the temperature of the air leaving this heating coil typically ranges from 55 to 75 degrees. So the water used for tempering does not need to be very hot. Many standard water-cooled chillers can provide suitable temperatures just by operating at a slightly elevated refrigerant condensing temperature. Now less, the last demification enhancement we'll discuss for chill water terminals is to use a dedicated outdoor air system. As its name applies, this system devotes one air handler to cooling and dehumidifying all the incoming outdoor air used for ventilation. Then this dry outdoor air is then delivered directly to the spaces or to the individual terminal units. Meanwhile, units located in or near each classroom condition recirculated air to offset the space sensible loads. Now we produced a broadcast in September 2001 on the subject of dedicated outdoor air system. And some of the key points from that broadcast were, first, always deliver conditioned outdoor air that is drier than the space, dry enough to also offset the space latent loads. Now this adequately limits indoor humidity without the need for additional dehumidification enhancements in the terminal units. 
Second, deliver cold conditioned air whenever possible. Neutral air increases the capacity required from the terminal units and typically requires reheat at the day kid outdoor air unit. For most school applications, select equipment to limit space relative humidity between 60 to 65 percent at worst case conditions. Now designing for lower indoor humidity levels is certainly possible, but requires larger equipment and increases energy consumption. Finally, take advantage of communicating controls to provide a better overall system. Now John, when you say a better overall system, uh, what kind of benefits can we get from community communicating controls? Well, specifically for schools, I think of improving the comfort performance of a two-pipe system in that changeover period of time. And secondly, providing after hours humidity control if you have a package DX 100% outside air unit. Okay, 100% outside air unit. Now, I can see using that with a chilled water system and a build-up air handler, or perhaps a unit that's designed for 100% outside air. But a lot of school jobs go rooftops, and they're designed for 20 to 25% outside air. How do we deal with that? Well, right, that was one of the challenges that Gary alluded to earlier. And the second system type includes a single DX unit located in or near each classroom. And we'll look at ways to improve the demification performance. Each unit is a basic single zone constant volume system. And examples of DX units in this category are packaged rooftops, split systems, wall hung units, and water source heat pumps. Now similar to the earlier example, the combination of a constant volume supply fan and a compressor that cycles on and off results in a warmer average coil surface and a warmer supplier temperature at part load conditions. Again, this results in less humidification and elevated space humidity levels. Applications with high ventilation requirements, such as school classrooms, can pose a significant dehumidification challenge for some constant volume DX units. More outdoor air, especially in hot, humid climates, requires more cooling capacity, or tons. However, this outdoor air is not part of the space sensible load, so supply airflow, or CFM required, is typically unaffected. For a given space load, an increase in the ventilation load requires a unit that can provide more capacity or tons at the same airflow, so a lower CFM per ton. Now, package DX equipment typically has a limited range of CFM per ton. Selecting a larger piece of equipment to provide the additional tons can often yield a higher than necessary supply airflow. Oversized supply airflow means a warmer supplier temperature and less dehumidification. In non-arid climates, the result is elevated space humidity levels, even at full load. We'll discuss two methods commonly used to improve the part load dehumidification performance of a single zone DX unit. The first is a multiple speed supply fan, and the second is direct control of space humidity by overcooling and reheating. In addition, a dedicated outdoor air system is sometimes used with certain types of single zone DX equipment. For schools, the most common example is probably a system that uses water source heat pumps. Now, similar to a chill water terminal unit, Stepping down the fan speed is the first step to reducing cooling capacity can improve the demification performance of a single zone DX unit. A traditional unit with a constant speed fan operates the fan whenever the classroom is occupied. A unit with a multiple speed fan attempts to operate at low speed whenever possible. This reduced supply airflow results in a colder supplier temperature at part load and improved demification performance. When the cooling load increases to the point where space temperature rises above set point, the unit controller automatically responds by switching to high speed fan operation. Combining the multiple speed supply fan with multiple compressors or a compressor that can unload can further improve the unification performance by allowing the compressor to operate for longer continuous periods of time at the lower supplier temperature. Now, the second deification enhancement, supplier tempering or reheat, was also discussed earlier. When space humidity is too high, cooling capacities increase to adequately dehumidify the air, and the downstream heating coil raises supplier temperature to avoid overcooling the space. Again, this provides direct control of space humidity. Now, using heat that is recovered from the refrigeration cycle of the DX unit can reduce system operating costs by avoiding the use of new energy reheat. This is typically accomplished by adding a heat recovery coil to the refrigeration circuit. This coil transfers sensible heat from the hot refrigerant vapor to the supply air downstream of the cooling coil. Again, this may also allow the system to meet local codes in ASHRAE's standard 90.1.
However, if not factory engineered and factory installed, use particular care when selecting the heat recovery coil or installing the refrigerant piping and controls. Failure to do so could cause compressor lubrication problems. Now, third system type consists of a centralized air handler and multiple VAV terminals. The VAV terminal serving each classroom modulates the volume of supply air to match the changing load in the space. Meanwhile, the central supply fan delivers only the quantity of air needed at a constant supplier temperature. As the sensible cooling load in the space decreases, this VAV system reduces supply airflow to the space. Because the supply air is still cool and dry, the relative humidity in the classroom only rises to 57% at this example part load condition, compared to 67% with the basic constant volume system. Now, by continuing to supply cool, dry air at part load, VAV systems typically provide effective demification over a wide range of conditions. However, two issues that can pose a demification challenge to a VAV system are the use of supplier temperature reset and high minimum airflow settings at the VAV terminals. In many VAV systems, the supplier temperature is reset upward at part load conditions in an attempt to save cooling or reheat energy. However, this warmer supplier results in less demification at the coil and elevated space humidity levels. It also increases the energy consumed by the supply fan, which may even negate, negate the cooling and reheat energy saved. The second challenge is high minimum airflow settings. Each VAV terminal has a minimum airflow setting that's based on the performance limits of the diffusers or terminal, or more likely in classrooms, on the ventilation requirement of, this, of that space. In densely occupied classrooms, these minimum airflow settings must be relatively high to assure proper ventilation. Eventually, the sensible cooling load in the space becomes small enough that the required supply airflow is less than this minimum setting. If the air is still delivered to the classroom without being tempered, the space will overcool and relative humidity will increase. The result is a classroom that feels cold and damp. Following are some ways to improve the dehumidification performance of a VAV system. First, avoid using supplier temperature reset during the cooling season. But if you do use it, consider providing a humidity sensor to override it if space humidity rises too high. Second, be sure to provide a source of heat for tempering at low cooling loads. Again, if using a hot water boiler, it needs to be available to operate during the cooling season. Alternatively, consider recover, recovering heat from another part of the system. And third, investigate the use of colder supply air. Lowering the supplier temperature reduces supply air flow and results in more moisture condensing on the coil and lower space humidity levels. Now, in summary, the HVAC system again, cannot prevent all moisture-related problems in buildings. This is a shared responsibility among all parties involved in the design, construction, maintenance, and use of the building. Next, the demification performance varies by type of HVAC system. The basic single zone constant volume system is probably the most often used in schools. In some applications, in some climates, it may demify just fine. In others, particularly for densely occupied spaces, and particularly in humid climates, enhancements may be required in order to dehumidify adequately at part load. Now, today we've shared several dehumidification enhancements for commonly used systems. The right choice for a given project depends on climate, building use, available budget, and operating cost goals. When properly designed and controlled, the HVAC system can provide effective dehumidification over a wide range of conditions. Mick? Well, John, now that we've covered indoor air quality, let's look at a, a fifth pillar that really a lot of the high performance schools programs look at, and that's acoustics. Frankly, if you can't hear, it's awfully hard to learn. Dave Guckelberger will help us understand how a new standard in acoustics may affect not only HVAC system design, but also how other choices such as siting, materials, and even windows can provide acoustic challenges within the classroom. Creating a high-performance school should include attention to the acoustical quality of the classrooms. A tremendous amount of documented research exists about speech interference. This research shows that background sound level and reverberation time are critical to intelligible speech. Considering the large quantity of information that is transferred verbally in the average school, it's easy to see the important role acoustics play in creating a high-performance learning environment. So, given that proper acoustics is important, 
how quiet should a classroom be? One obvious place to look is in the building codes. Although some local jurisdictions specify sound levels for schools, all the model codes and the majority of state codes are silent on classroom sound level requirements. Recommendations are given by several organizations, but by far the most complete specification is provided by the Acoustical Society of America. Back in 1997, ASA recognized the need for a comprehensive standard on classroom acoustics and started the standards creation ball rolling. Coincidentally, in 1998, a petition was made to the Architectural Transportation Barriers Compliance Board by the parent of a hearing impaired child. One result of this action was that the Access Board threw its support behind ASA's standard writing effort. The efforts of these groups resulted in the publication of ANSI ASA Standard 1260 titled Acoustical Performance Criteria, Design Requirements, and Guidelines for Schools. Since its introduction, the standard has had mixed reviews. Some people are happy to finally have a comprehensive standard on classroom acoustics. Others question whether the methods and levels set by the standard are really required to attain good speech communication in the classroom. In any case, the standard is generating lots of discussion about the requirements for classroom sound levels, and it's very likely that sound level requirements will appear in construction specifications for schools. We won't debate the merits of the NCASA standard in today's presentation nor will we spend any time linking research findings to the establishment of a sound level for classrooms. For information on these topics, see the train newsletter associated with this broadcast. Instead, let's start with the premise that the learning environment is enhanced by proper acoustics and look at how to meet an acoustical goal. The first step in designing for proper acoustics is to define the acoustical target for the classroom. Simply stating, the classroom must be quiet will not suffice. That may seem obvious, but it is too often the case that acoustical requirements are poorly defined. For the sake of this discussion, we'll use the ANSI ASA standard as our target and then take a look at what's required to achieve that goal. This table shows the maximum background sound levels and reverberation times for core learning spaces as outlined by the standard. Basically, the requirement for a typically sized classroom is 35 dBA with a reverberation time of 0.6 to 0.7 seconds depending upon room volume. Using DBA for an indoor sound requirement might be a little unfamiliar to some people. To put the 35 dBA requirement into perspective, we've plotted several sound spectrums on an NC chart. First, we added an example of the worst case background sound measured during a study of classrooms in Ohio. Then we plotted ASHRAE's recommendations for open plan offices and classrooms. And finally, the 35 dBA requirement. Notice that the 35 dBA requirement is approximately equal to NC27. Two things are evident from this figure. Although the Ohio study did find schools that meet ANSI's requirements, it revealed that unrestricted classroom sound levels can be much too high to provide good speech communication. The chart also shows that ANSI's recommendation is significantly lower than the commonly used design targets for background sound. One requirement is to adequ adequately control reverberation. Reverberation describes the echoes that result when sound waves bounce off reflecting surfaces. The echoed sound waves interfere with the direct sound waves, which results in an overall increase in room sound level and interference that makes speech indistinct. Reverberation time represents how long the echoes last after the original sound stops. Reverberation time is determined by both room volume and absorption. Room volume is typically a given, so we'll focus on absorption. Adding absorption to a room reduces reverberation time. Classrooms typically have very little absorption. For cleanability, the floor is uncarpeted. One wall may contain a lot of glass. One wall will be covered with whiteboards. And another wall may have cabinets or other hard surface storage. This leaves the ceiling as the primary absorptive surface, so choosing a good quality ceiling tile is critical but treating only the ceiling may not be enough. Absorptive material works better when it is applied on two adjacent surfaces rather than just on one surface or two opposite surfaces. When adding absorption, remember that reflective surfaces can be useful in directing sound. Placing a reflective surface behind the instructor helps sound reach the back of the room. So does a ceiling with a reflective surface in the center and absorptive surfaces around the perimeter. Absorption on the back wall helps prevent sound from bouncing back towards the teacher. 
Another effective solution is to combine an acoustical tile ceiling with a band of absorbent material along the top of the side and back walls. This alternative is less likely to inter interfere with the use of the walls for other purposes. Now let's look at meeting the background sound level requirement. The background sound in a room is the sum of the sounds from all the sound sources impacting the room. We will ignore sound generated by audiovisual equipment, computers, and other portable, portable equipment. We will also exclude student-generated sound. While these sound sources can contribute significantly to the background sound, they need to be addressed separately from the construction considerations. The in-room sound contributors that need to be considered include HVAC, lighting, and plumbing. But sources outside the room also contribute to the background sound level. Sounds generated outside the room may come from adjacent spaces, such as other rooms or the hallway. Sounds from outside the building can come from a wide variety of sources, such as transportation noise, lawnmowers, equipment located on or near the top of the building. Regardless of the source, sounds originating outside the room are generally treated by correctly choosing construction materials and methods that result in walls, floors, and ceilings that provide sufficient transmission loss. The ANSI ASA standard provides tables of minimum sound transmission class ratings for various applications. However, final selection of materials will depend on the external sound levels. In thinking about the acoustic requirements, it really shows why all the high performance school programs talk about integrated design. For example, an architect might want to use natural ventilation where the windows are open. Well, that takes into account the outside sound from lawn mowing equipment and traffic. Uh, next is the acoustic requirements. If we put absorptive material around the classroom, that affects the aesthetics, and once again, the architects involved. And finally, from a daylighting perspective, if we think back to the slide with the light shelf, that's going to affect the acoustics, and we really need to look at it from an integrated design standpoint. So it's very important that the architect, the mechanical engineer, the lighting engineer, all those people work together with the school district as a design team. Now, just from a mechanical side on the acoustics, Dave, can you take us through some of the common mechanical systems people use in schools and how acoustics may or may not fit into the standard? Sure. Let's turn our attention then to sounds generated by the services in the room, in particular the contribution of the HVAC system. A wide variety of HVAC systems can be used in schools. Rather than discuss each system type individually, I've grouped these systems into three categories that share common attributes. They are in-room products, near-room products, and central systems. For each of these categories, we can apply the source path receiver model. This method of modeling breaks the sound from the source into separate paths. Each path starts with the sound power data of the source, contains corrections for each element of the, the sound encounters as it travels from the source to the receiver, and ends in a room correction, which accounts for the acoustical characteristics of the room. In this case, the receiver room is a 30 by 32 by 9 foot classroom that has an acoustical tile ceiling, and the receiver is a student sitting 6 feet from where the sound enters the room. As an aside, acoustical analysis is built on the foundation of accurate sound data. Missing, incomplete, inaccurate, or estimated sound data will directly transfer to an inaccurate prediction. In other words, garbage in, garbage out. Now let's look at in-room products. Products in this category include cabinet models of unit ventilators and fan coils, PTAC units, and mini splits. For source data, start with the total octaband sound power data for the unit. The path for in-room products is just the space between the unit and the receiver. Essentially, this amounts to the room correction being the path. Perhaps the simplest way to look at in-room units is to work backwards, starting with the 35 dBA requirement and adding room correction to determine the required unit sound levels. But before we do that, let me make it clear that we're looking at one example case. Do not translate the results of this one example or any of the other cases I'll review to make a general statement. Each situation is unique and should be individually modeled. OK, using an RC curve to generate octave band sound levels from the 35 dBA requirement, we can back into the required sound level for the in-room unit. This figure shows the room correction added to the 35 dBA spectrum. The top line is the octaband sound power requirement for the in-room unit. 
The obvious way to meet a sound target using an in-room system is to choose a sufficiently quiet unit. Other things to consider are choosing an oversized unit and reducing the fan speed or using multiple units provided that they can be located far enough apart not to add acoustically. Finding in-room equipment that meets the 35 dBA requirement may be difficult, but as the demand for these units increases, it is likely that quieter units will become available. And it really becomes important to analyze those in-room units in an acoustic analysis to find out whether or not the sound power levels are low enough for us to apply in that particular space. Um, now, Dave, can you take us through what happens if we move the unit outside of the room? I think you called it a near-room unit? That's right. Near-room products offer a slight advantage to in-room products because the path is longer and offers opportunities for attenuation. Near-room products include concealed unit vents and fan coils, water source heat pumps, and rooftop units when they are dedicated to the room. For these units, sound typically travels along three paths from the supply to the receiver, supply airborne, return airborne, and casing radiated. In most cases, it's also wise to check the duct breakout sound from the supply and return ducts. To make the model as accurate as possible, start with unit sound data that is broken into discharge, inlet, and casing components. Starting with total sound and making assumptions about how the sound is divided will reduce the accuracy of the prediction. The supply path starts with discharge sound data and follows the ductwork from the unit into the room. Ducted returns are treated in the same manner even though the sound is traveling in the opposite direction of the airflow. If the return path is unducted, it can be lumped in with a casing radiated path. When the unit is installed above an occupied space, only the ceiling tile isolates the casing radiated sound from the receiver. Although ceiling tile can be very useful for its absorptive characteristics, it is not an effective barrier. If you choose to install the unit over a classroom, it's important to also provide an intervening barrier to attenuate casing radiated sound. Building a box around the unit can serve this purpose if the box is created out of a high transmission loss material like gypsum board and is well sealed. The major problem with this approach is that it will most likely inhibit access to the unit for servicing. It's generally best to move the unit so that it isn't over the occupied space. This allows the use of a wall to block the casing radiated sound. It also allows for longer duct runs, which can be a benefit when attenuating supply and return sound paths. Supply and return paths are best attenuated by modifying the ductwork. Adding a silencer is an option, but remember that the silencer adds static pressure. Be sure to properly, properly select the fan to handle the added pressure drop, and remember that when a fan works harder, it makes more noise. Duct lining is essentially a zero pressure drop silencer that effectively attenuates duct-borne sound. Adding duct lining can be controversial because of IAQ concerns, but my advice is to keep a way, find a way to keep the duct lining. Duct manufacturers are starting to make cleanable lined duct. Duct elbows and junctions can also be advantageous provided that duct velocity is kept low. Elbows cause reflection, which reduces the amount of sound traveling down the duct. Junct junctions split the sound in proportion to the division of airflow. If one diffuser is used, all the sound traveling down the supply duct comes out that diffuser. By putting a junction in the duct and using two diffusers, half as much sound comes out each diffuser. Remember that sound naturally diminishes with distance, so to take optimum advantage of the junction sound split, spread the diffusers as far apart as possible. A diffuser is the entry point to the room for duck-borne sound but diffusers also generate sound. The sound power data provided by the diffuser manufacturer must be added to the duct-borne sound. Select diffusers with care to avoid increasing the overall sound level in the space and to help create a balanced spectrum. I've mentioned several changes that can be made to improve near-room units. Here's a specific example using water source heat pump. Without any acoustical consideration, the unit might get located in the plenum over the classroom as shown here. The supply duct in our example runs 10 feet, splits at a T-junction, runs an additional 10 feet to the two diffusers. To improve this application, the unit is moved out of the plenum space into an adjacent room. The supply ducts were lined, and a lined return duct that terminates in the plenum space above the room was added. This slide shows before and after sound predictions. Placing the unit over the space resulted in an NC53 59 dBA sound spectrum. Not quite as bad as the example we saw earlier from the Ohio School study, but still well above our target. 
The changes that were made bring the overall level down to NC25, 31 dBA. This is below our target of 35 dBA, but remember that we are only considering the HVAC contribution to the background sound. We also have to consider the sound from other sound sources that impact the room. Now one real important point to make here is that we need to make sure that we don't just look at the HVAC side and say we take it out of the room and we'll be within the new sound level requirements. Um, you need to analyze it. This was one example. Secondly, one thing Dave said there was that we need to look at the other sound sources. There have actually been studies done where it showed that the lighting alone caused backroom sounds of 35 dBA. So we need to once again look at it from a holistic approach. Dave, let's take it down the home stretch and talk a little bit about the central systems. Okay. Uh, central systems generally have the loudest sound sources because for a single unit to serve many spaces, it must have more airflow, and more airflow gener generally means more noise. However, central systems can also, pr also offer the greatest flexibility in path attenuation. Units in this category include chillers with central station air handling units and large rooftop air conditioners. A good example of the concentration of sound in the central system is a large rooftop unit. A single enclosure houses a supply fan, a return or exhaust fan, plus the refrigeration compressors and condenser fans, all of which generate sound. Sound paths for central systems can include supply and return airborne paths, supply and return duct breakout paths, and the structural transmission path through the wall, floor, or ceiling. The wide variety of equipment options, installations, and receiver locations make it difficult to show an average central system model. This variety is a two-edged sword. It adds complexity, but it also adds beneficial flexibility in sound attenuation methods. Let's look at the structural transmissions path first. The advantage of path attenuation on central systems cannot be realized unless the unit is properly located. Construct the walls, floor, or ceiling surfaces that are common to sound sensitive areas out of materials with the proper transmission loss. This can sometimes be difficult with roof mounted equipment. The best location for large rooftop units and central air handlers is away from sound sensitive spaces. Place the unit over or surround it with non-sound sensitive areas such as bathrooms, utility rooms, and stairwells. Thoughtful placement of such equipment will diminish problems with casing radiated sound and will help with the next sound path, duct breakout sound. The duct breakout path accounts for sound that resonates through the duct wall. This sound path is possible in any section of ductwork, but it is of greatest concern on large aspect ratio rectangular ducts near the sound source. Think of the large flat surface of these ducts as the diaphragm of a speaker and the sound pressure inside the duct as the driver. This arrangement is very effective at radiating sound. As a result, it's important to avoid routing main supply or return ducts over sound sensitive areas. When main supply or return ducts must be routed over sound sensitive areas, duct breakout can be reduced by duct lagging, round duct, or using multiple takeoffs from a plenum on the unit. Duct lagging involves wrapping the duct with gypsum board or some other dense material to increase the transmission loss through the duct wall. Round duct is much stiffer than rectangular or flat oval duct and naturally has a naturally high transmission loss. The problem generally encountered with round duct is having sufficient space in the ceiling plenum. Using multiple taps from a plenum on the air handling unit can help with the round duct space problem and it also splits the sound at the source so that there is less sound pressure in each of the ducts. By routing the takeoffs in different directions, no one area is exposed to the total sound potential of the supply. Airborne paths for central systems are similar to the airborne paths of near room units. The main difference is that many of the rooms served by the central unit can be a considerable distance from the sound source. Lining the ducts or even just the first few sections of duct work is typically all that's required to sufficiently reduce the induct sound levels. Of course, there are some exceptions. First of all, pay particular attention to the rooms closest to the sound source. These rooms do not have the distance advantage. Secondly, poorly designed ductwork can generate sound. The effect of elbows, junctions, and takeoffs can be calculated, but watch out for those surprises that show up when ductwork is wrapped around a pipe, beam, or other obstruction. 
These examples of poor duct installation practices come from the ASHRAE book titled A Practical Guide to Noise and Vibration Control for HVAC Systems, which is an excellent reference source for good design practices. In addition to duct work, also review the terminal devices like VAV boxes when they are used. Even VAV boxes without fans generate sound, and this sound is added to the sound traveling down the duct. Some additional duct line or downstream of the VAV boxes may be necessary to absorb box-generated sound. VAV boxes also have a radiated sound component, so location of these devices is important. Acoustical consideration for VAV units are similar to those given for near-room units. In addition to the path attenuation options that I've mentioned, central systems typically offer flexibility in source attenuation options. In some cases, it's possible to change the fan type, add a plenum, or pick a different unit configuration that will significantly reduce the sound produced by the unit. There's lots of material to cover on classroom acoustics, and we've just skimmed the surface. The important point to remember is that proper acoustics can make classrooms much more effective at learning environments. Creating a high-performance school in this context is a matter of designing to attain the acoustical target. The ingredients for acoustical success are the same as the ingredients for acoustical success on any project. They are a properly defined acoustical goal, accurate sound data, acoustical analysis, detailed specifications, and careful construction. Thanks for that summary on acoustics, Dave. And let's make sure that we integrate that acoustic design with what the architect and the electrical designer are doing too. Now that we've spent time looking at things from our industry's perspective, ventilation, moisture control, and classroom acoustics, let's ask Pete Berger to help us focus on what the school district is looking for, what keeps the administrators awake at night, and give us some insight on school funding mechanics. Thank you, Mick. In your dealings with school districts, you have probably heard them express most, if not all, of these educational priorities. Each of these priorities is impacted by budget decisions made by the school district, particularly when capital budgets and operating budgets are not looked upon in unison. In an ideal world, every school district would employ leading edge building designs, materials, equipment, maintenance techniques, and operational practices. The reality is, Adequate capital funding is often difficult to obtain to invest in badly needed infrastructure and compromises need to be made. This often results in buildings that have a negative rather than positive impact on both the learning environment and ongoing operating budgets. In fact, the facility itself affects each of these educational priorities. The best way to deal with the challenge of resource allocation is to help the school district establish clear decision criteria based upon best current thinking with regards to facility construction, maintenance, and operation. When working with a school district, first you must define the features of a high performance school facility. Then clearly articulate the cost benefit trade-off of these features in terms of their impact on the school district's educational priorities. For example, become familiar with the impact indoor air quality and classroom acoustics have on a child's ability to learn. There are numerous studies that document the effects that are available through the National Clearinghouse for Education. When a child must stay home due to an asthma attack, they miss out on that day's instruction, which impacts their learning and subsequent test scores. When a teacher must stay home after losing his or her voice from having to shout over the din of a loud HVAC system, the school district must pay for a substitute teacher and instruction is disrupted. The best way for you as a facility design professional to assist the school district's administration and board in establishing project design goals that balance their educational priorities with available funding is to get involved as early as possible to have an impact. In addition to high performance school design, having a solid understanding of available funding puts you in tune with the challenges school districts face and will enable you to add value to their decision making process. The most common method used to fund school district capital projects is the use of bond referendums. 
Nearly all projects require some local funding, and in most cases, local bonds fund the majority of a project. Bonds are placed on the ballot during a general election and require approval by a majority of voters. What constitutes majority varies by state from a simple majority up to two-thirds majority. By approving, voters agree to pay for school district capital projects over the next 20 plus years. In an effort to equalize funding between poor and wealthy school districts, many states are providing a larger portion of school funding than in the past. Along with state money comes state requirements. Ohio has very detailed school construction requirements that accompany state funding, right down to the classroom pencil sharpener. New York and New Jersey require new schools meet LEED requirements to obtain state funding. California requires school projects receiving state funding to be approved by their Division of State Architect for structural design, ADA compliance, and California Title 24 energy consumption standards. In Pennsylvania, some school districts choose to forego state money because the cost of compliance exceeds the 25% matching funds they receive. In other states, the use of temporary sales tax is the preferred method of funding capital projects. This is the approach used in Florida, where school districts and counties align geographically, making a county sales tax easier to implement. Still other states dedicate a portion of lottery funds for school funding. Many new communities have invoked builder fees as a method of funding school construction. These communities assess a fee of two to three dollars per square foot on new home construction. This money goes directly to the school district to fund the construction of new school facilities. Many utilities provide owner incentives for energy efficient design. For example, Pacific Gas and Electric offers the owner up to $150,000 and up to an additional $50,000 for the design team. Some states provide additional funding above the amount shown on the map for school districts that exceed certain energy efficiency levels. In California, school districts receive up to an extra 5% in state matching funds if building energy efficiency exceeds California Title 24 standards. California is also currently considering a bill that would increase state matching funds by 2% if the project meets CHIPS requirements, and 1% if the project meets LEED requirements. Not all school districts are aware of these additional sources of funding for energy efficient design. Being knowledgeable of these additional funds will enable you, the design professional, to advise school districts on how to fund better school facilities. Getting involved early in the decision process will enable you to have maximum impact. It's a real irony in the education market relative to school funding when after a school district passes a large bond referendum, they claim they don't have any money. While to a certain extent, this may be true. Funds raised by bond referendums, special sales taxes, etc., are capital dollars and can only be used to pay for capital projects they were intended. These capital funds cannot be used to supplement the general fund, also known as the operating budget. For this reason, a school district can be both flush with capital funds, yet have an operating budget shortfall. Thus the irony. There is one way we can help school districts faced with this dilemma. By designing high performance school facilities, we allow them to invest capital dollars in high efficiency building systems and designs that consume less of their operating budget than standard designs. Through the use of high performance school design and technology, we are effectively shifting more plentiful capital dollars to their cash starved operating budget. Using a life cycle cost analysis, you can demonstrate how this approach is also in the long term best interest of the taxpayer who is funding both budgets. I'm sure by now you are all familiar with the life cycle cost concept. It's the best method of illustrating the long-term financial impact of your high-performance school design. 
be sure to include the cost of performing proper system maintenance. This is an area school districts often overlook when developing budgets. Consider options for extended equipment warranties as a method for shifting capital dollars to the school district's operating budget and protecting them from unplanned future expenses. Note the importance of timely changing of air filters and proper system operation to control moisture during off hours. These types of assumptions are critical to assure adequate budget dollars exist to maintain good indoor air quality and achieving their educational priorities. Thanks for that information from the school district's point of view. And now let's move to, into our facts and questions section. Uh, Gary, we're going to send the first one to you, and it's from Florida. Um, does ASHRAE 62N allow for a diversity of 50% if the classroom is occupied for less than three hours? Um, yes, you're referring to the intermittent occupancy clause there. And as far as I know, uh, 62N does not address that. Uh, nor does any of the addenda that have been previously approved, nor any that are coming up in the near future. So that has remained the same. Okay, thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, John, let's take one to you. Uh, not one word about face and bypass control when we're talking about humidity control? Well, certainly, uh, certainly face and bypass dampers is another approach taken sometimes to improve deunification performance. Um, didn't talk about in this broadcast, mostly due to time. The application manual I mentioned, the deunification one, it's in your bibliography, it goes into a, a lot of detail about the different configurations of, of face and bypass, whether it's mixed air or return air bypass, and some of the equipment configuration requirements in order to make it work properly. And talks about the benefit and, and how good it is at doing that. Thanks, John. Um, Dave, we're going to bring one to you from Ohio. Uh, many people believe that they're providing for low classroom NC levels, NC25, and they don't look at the path to breakout transmission because they're just selecting the VAV boxes. Can you please address that issue? Sure. This is a great question. The, the um, sound in a room is the sum of all the sounds entering that room. So to focus on just one component like the diffusers leaves out everything else. The other thing about looking at just the diffuser is that that diffuser NC rating is based on some assumed room criteria. So if your room differs substantially from their assumptions, uh, you won't even end up with an NC at that level, even if everything else isn't contributing. So we really need to look at it a case-by-case -case basis, use an analysis, pro an analysis program. Definitely. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, Pete, we have one for you. And given the complexity of the interrelationship of the various building systems, can you comment on the relative importance of a successful building commissioning program? And that comes to us from Virginia. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, building system commissioning has, uh, is extremely important for the success of a high-performance school design, particularly to assure that the intended results of performance are achieved on the long term. And in fact, we're starting to see uh, many uh, states look at this importance, and in fact, one state has led this effort, Minnesota, has legislated uh, the detail commissioning specifications be included in all school specifications. Thanks. Um, I'd also, I guess, like to point out that ASHRAE standard 90.1, I believe it's once you get to 50,000 square feet, requires that the consulting engineer put together a, a specified plan for building commissioning. So um, commissioning is certainly an important part of this. Uh, Gary, we're going to come back to you. Um, with the 62AA revision, um, how is the separation distance to be calculated? For example, it says 25 feet from a cooling tower. Is this total distance, including horizontal and vertical? Uh, what, what, what's up with that? Okay, um, the, the distance is our line of sight. Um, shortest distance between two points because that's obviously the path that the air is going to take. Uh, in addition to these specific distances that are listed, there is an exception in there that if uh, that you can use for such as packaged equipment like rooftops, where you if you can demonstrate that due to the direction that and the velocity that you're discharging the air that it is not re-entrained into the outdoor air, that would be acceptable. Okay. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, Murph, we're going to come back to you for one, and this one kind of caught me by surprise when we were going through the rehearsals. ASHRAE in one of its uh, standards talks about 40 to 60 percent relative humidity, 
but when we were talking, you were looking at 60 to 65 percent relative humidity. Uh, has something changed? Well, uh, probably the ASHRAE standards we're talking about, there's, there's two of them, ASHRAE 62, the current version at least, talks about 30 to 60 percent as a recommendation. Um, ASHRAE 55, which is a comfort standard, has a, a upper limit that's it's kind of based on, on that same range in terms of humidity. Uh, there's a revision in there. There's also an addenda that just recently got approved uh, for publication that has not been published yet, 62X, that deals with uh, demification part load, and, and it references 65 percent at a peak dew point condition, and I'll kind of respond a little bit more detail in, in the written response to, to direct you to that. So that's kind of why the 60 to 65 percent range was recommended for, for schools with a dedicated outdoor air system. So to say, it's important to stay on track with things. Things are changing uh, many times, so we try to, you know, get the latest information out to you. Uh, Dave, another acoustics question. Um, is the ANSI ASA standard required by law, and if not, will it be? Good question. Let me back up a little bit and say that, you know, just as a standard, it's not a requirement to follow the, stand, the, uh, the ANSI ASA 1260. The way that could get enacted as a requirement would be, well, there's a couple, sub, there's a couple different paths. One would be at a federal level, um, federal mandate, that any time you're using federal dollars to build a school or remodel a school, you'd have to follow this standard. A step down from that would be adopt adoption by a model code agency, like the International Code Council. The standard was submitted to the International Code Council for the last review cycle, and they didn't include it. It's been resubmitted, and I'm not sure at this point whether they're going to include it or not. After it's in a model code, that's when states adopt, and the state then puts that into their law, and that, that requirement then has to be followed. I don't know of any states at this time that have uh, adopted a standard into, into their state codes. The next level down from that would be a county or a school district or you know, even a school board deciding that they wanted to follow it. And we do know of uh, a couple counties in Florida that are following the standard. So not real sure where it's going to go in the future, but the efforts that I see are, are working towards it coming in to um, be a requirement in, in one of those forms. Great. Thanks. Uh, and, you know, that's a pretty involved answer to a, what seemed like a simple question. Uh, Gary, we're going to come over to you. Uh, this, I, I like this one. Due to the minimal requirements for air conditioning in our state, non-mechanical means of ventilation, windows, are often used as acceptable for schools. Does there, is there a push to force schools to use mechanical ventilation or air conditioning in the warmer months, regardless of the climate? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I think in general there is a move just through the whole sustainable building uh, process to go more with natural ventilation. In fact, the CHIPS uh, program in California does give a point, does give some credit if you use natural ventilation. I believe LEED also has some, some advantages there. I think schools may be a little bit more of a, of a challenge than possibly some other buildings just because of the amount of, of ventilation that they require. Um, trying to get that much air through some typical operable windows and things uh, would be challenging. Thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, Pete, we're going to come down to you. Um, how can somebody develop a better understanding for the level of funding in their locale? Uh, Mick, the best place to start is with your State Department of Education. And each state has a website with a wealth of information and also will list contacts that you could call to get specifics. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to answer a question here. Uh, I mentioned a reference for daylighting in the material, and it's not directly in the bibliography. Where it is is in many of the high-performance school programs, um, within those programs on their websites, they do have links to daylighting. So I apologize for misspeaking there. And then there was another one that talked about uh, CO2 levels and what are the proper CO2 levels to use. And those levels are listed in an engineer's newsletter so you can, can go out in the bibliography to the train.com website and look at that newsletter. So I, I guess I want to say, first of all, thank you to our panel for answering questions, and thank you to you for uh, sending them in. Uh, for those we weren't able to get to, we will provide answers through your local train office. And our goal is to get them out there in a, in a few weeks. Sometimes we have a lot, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer. In summary of today's broadcast, there's a lot of interest in high-performance schools and a huge opportunity. School construction in all sectors is occurring every day, and there are funds available to get things right. Now, with that said, to get things right not only requires integrated design, 
but construction and proper operation. If you think about it, many of the systems that are already being used today may actually be able to produce high performance facilities when they are operated as designed and intended. Uh, to that end, uh, you know, Pete addressed it. One state now requires full commissioning by a third party before the last 20% of construction costs are paid. This puts some teeth into the contracts and helps ensure that the building has a chance of being sustainable. You know, perhaps it's time for all of us to go back to school and do our homework. Uh, how can we help school districts achieve their priorities by helping provide the healthy, comfortable, efficient and sustainable facilities that allow education to occur? There's a lot of information out there waiting to be digested. By learning what's available and integrating that design, construction, and operation, the goals can be achieved. Now, this may require stepping out of our normal comfort zone and becoming a true partner with other design professionals, educators, and the school administrators. Um, I had a personal opportunity the past two years to chair a $1.4 million expansion of our church's school. And I don't think our experience was different than most. As an owner, my eyes were really open to how our industry works. In general, our customers don't understand the construction process, and we may not always help them understand their choices or the ramifications of those choices. As professionals in this industry, we can do a much better job of first listening to our customers' priorities and then communicating what can be done. The process can run more smoothly, and the building owner and occupants are much more likely to have their expectations met. Uh, for background and more information on classroom acoustics, please see Dave's Engineers newsletter published this summer. It's available on the website. And for high performance schools, there are a lot of resources available. The bibliography we provided today is the largest array of materials we've ever put together for an engineer's newsletter live broadcast. And much of it is either low or no cost to you. Now, if you haven't been with us since 1999, you may want to check out one of the ENL classics available from the Train Bookstore. In the meantime, we really want your feedback on today's broadcast so that we can continue to improve. Please share your thoughts. Finally, we're proud to announce the dates and topics for our 2004 Engineers Newsletter Live season. In February, we'll be looking at LEED and HVAC systems. Then we'll really dig into improving dehumidification performance of systems with a focus this time on retail facilities. That will take place in May. And then in past broadcasts, we've covered chilled water plants, but sometimes you've told us it seems to focus on the larger plants. So we'll wrap up our 2004 season in September discussing small chilled water plants. Thank you again for joining us today, and we'll see you in February. Thank you.